Happy Friday, pilots and aviation enthusiasts. Welcome to the Commercial PIC Show. This podcast is brought to you by Commercial Pilot in Command, the channel that provides you aviation expertise from 250 to 1,500 hours. Take command of your pilot career at commercialpic.com. All right, I hope you guys are ready for another episode. I'm Seth, as always, and I'll be your host today. You are listening to a brand new aviation podcast where I share with you some of my knowledge and experiences of being a commercial pilot, cruising right beside you on your journey to build those monumental 1,500 flight hours. So who is this podcast for? Well, if you're an aspiring or newly graduated commercial pilot wondering what should you do next or... Maybe you've had a few pilot jobs and you kind of want to get more serious about building your career. Well, then this podcast is for you. And hey, guess what? I've been there and I know exactly what you're going through. This episode is called, Will I Ever Be Able to Fly Again? Going to talk about two topics, broken bones and airmanship. All right, quick background for anybody who doesn't know me. I am a restricted ATP commercial pilot in general aviation. I started my aviation journey in 2005, and I've worked in this industry from loading munitions on fighter jets in the Air Force to flying banners on beaches, around professional race car events, and even professional football games, to then going on to flying cargo twin-engine airplanes across the Rocky Mountains. And for the past few years, I've been creating content on YouTube, Facebook, and other social media platforms to help career pilots like yourself get started on their journey. Speaking of that, I have to say a big thank you to my audience on YouTube. The channel has finally crossed 10,000 subscribers, and I'm absolutely over the moon about it. Last week when I mentioned it, we were getting close, and now I'm already almost to 10,100 subscribers. So... For you guys and girls out there who came in at the last minute and brought the channel over the line, you're absolutely awesome. And I hope the channel continues to grow. And I really appreciate every single one of you that is following and subscribed on YouTube. Thank you so much. This podcast is available on YouTube. It's available on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, and even Amazon Music. So if you're new here, hey, welcome. If you're a returning listener, I just want you to know I really appreciate you, and I thank you so much for your continued support. Hey, stick around to the end where I have a pro pilot tip for you that you are not going to want to miss. All right, so the agenda for today is I'm going to give you two topics. The first topic I'm going to talk about is actually going to be airmanship first, and then I'll talk about my broken bones at the end of the episode. But I want to get into the meat and potatoes of this topic of airmanship and how important it is. Do that first, and then I'll tell you guys about my very unique accident that I had and how it is going to affect my flying moving forward for a while. Okay, let's talk about airmanship and some ADM. I want to recommend a book to you called Better Aerobatics by Alan Cassidy. You should definitely go to audible.com, the link I have below, and search for this book. It's one you're definitely going to want to pick up, and you can get it for free if you use the link that I have below. The inspiration for this information comes from a pilot named Jake, who's a friend of my other friend, James. And so these guys put together this article, which I will link in the description at a future date. So let's take a quote from this book, Better Aerobatics. Airmanship is all about doing the right thing in every aspect of your flying. It is a combination of protocol, etiquette, common sense, self-discipline, awareness, and above all, mental attitude. Airmanship has a number of very important benefits, which I can summarize as follows. You can put these in any order of importance that you want. Airmanship keeps you alive. Airmanship keeps you out of prison. Airmanship earns you respect. Airmanship keeps your maintenance bills down. That's true. (laughs) Airmanship would keep everyone's insurance premiums down. That's a good one. Airmanship is a combination of knowledge and its application. To do the right thing, you have to know what the right thing is, and you have to care enough to do it. So to me, this is important because you really need to have good airmanship skills, and you really need to have good ADM, also known as 
aeronautical decision making because it's not just a flying skill you know it's a it's a you skill if that makes sense it's really more than that it's kind of a total package of how you approach flying let's be honest being a pilot is difficult right it's not easy if everybody was doing it or if it was easy everybody'd be doing it right it's not easy to learn and is anybody ever really done learning it not really but a dedication to airmanship makes and means that flying well the process of flying is going to be a lot easier the thing is though you really have to raise your own standards it's kind of like your own personal checklist your own personal minimums going back to your training the thing though is making the right decision can sometimes go wrong and it can be the difference between life and death good example of that is taking on a job to satisfy the needs of a client but by doing that you put yourself into a situation that you can't get out of an example that's kobe bryant right we all know the story in fact i have a video about that story which you can go on to youtube.com and watch but anyways back to airmanship so I like to say, don't try to be perfect. Strive for excellence, not perfection, because you're never going to get perfection. You're just not. Strive for excellence, because at the end of the day, when you're demonstrating airmanship or you're doing new maneuvers or whatever, you're, you're not going to do it perfectly. Do it the best that you possibly can and try and get better. So when we fall short, make note of your errors. Learn from your mistakes. I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of this episode in regards to the mistake that I made. I want to encourage you that making an unpopular decision is okay if it's in the interest of safety. Especially considering your own limitations, you're still demonstrating good airmanship. Safety should be the number one thing. That should always be the number one thing because if you take safety seriously, you'll fly again the next day. You'll get in the airplane again. If you have to cut the flight short because of a reason, well, if you did it in the name of safety, then that was good ADM. Good job. Keep doing that. So what is the opposite of airmanship? It's really not stroking somebody's ego, and it's not dismissing errors out of a some kind of fear, right? Or Or being humiliated or whatever. And it's also not boldly charging into a situation you, th you think about it the old saying there's old pilots and there's bold pilots but there's no old bold pilots right so when you're approaching your personal limitations think about airmanship think about safety and think about adm how can you stop the swiss cheese model from happening if you foster a passion for good airmanship that can be the best thing that you can do to stack the odds in your favor and you do that every single day, eventually you do that every day, it builds up to stacking the odds in your favor over a long aviation career. And that's important. So again, Alan Cassidy's Better Aerobatics, really a great book, full of knowledge. And I love that it says aerobatics because acrobatics drives me insane. It's not a gymnast, it's an airplane, it's aerobatics. Anyways, but the first 14 pages are kind of particularly valuable for all pilots across aviation i highly recommend that you check it out and if you can find the audio version that would be even better right all right real quick before we get into the next subject if you want to be a part of supporting this show feel free to head over to the patreon.com slash commercial pic page where supporters can opt in to three different tiers it's a great opportunity to become a member of a community that contributes each month to the creation of this show, and each person gains exclusive perks based on their tier, based on the ones that they're in. Some of those perks include merchandise, early access to upcoming videos, mock interview sessions, and even personalized resume feedback if you choose. But hey, regardless, there is no commitment to have access to the content in this show. If you're only interested in being a listener, that's perfectly fine. You can always enjoy this show at your leisure. If that interests you, check out the comments or the show notes below to find links where you can support. So I'm going to get into this story. Some of it's a little explicit in regards to the details of 
what happened. So just a warning, if you've got a light stomach or you faint thinking about, you know, broken stuff and whatever, just skip ahead through this part and you can continue on with the podcast. But that's your fair warning because I'm getting ready to get into some gnarly details. Okay, so as I had mentioned in the last episode and even a post that I had put up a couple weeks ago, actually like less than a week ago, uh, I broke my arm pretty badly. As I'm recording this, I'm sitting here in front of my computer. I've got my arm elevated. It's got ice on it. And my right hand has a broken finger. So I have really not much use of my left arm right now, including my hand. And I only have use of three fingers and a thumb on my right hand. So I basically went from ten fingers to three fingers and a thumb. All right, so you're probably wondering what happened. Well, as boys do, we kind of forget sometimes that our body ages, right? Our mind is like, hey, I can go do fun things and be crazy and do uh, stunts or whatever you want to call it, right? And then you do something really stupid and you break something. Well, I've never broken anything before. I've gone all my life pretty lucky i'm in my 30s let's just say because i've actually received quite a bit of judgment for what i did uh, i'm just going to tell you guys that i was out doing a recreational activity that i love to do i wasn't flying or anything like that but i took a really really hard fall i was in motion and basically what happened is is that when i went down i tucked my head and rolled to protect my head And your body kind of instinctively tries to protect the fall. So my left arm went out straight in front of me and snapped my radius and my ulna completely in half. After that happened, I tumbled and rolled about 12 times until I finally came to a stop. I was covered in dirt and I was staring up at the sky thinking that was about the stupidest thing I think I've ever done. Why did I do that? And I knew instantly. My arm was so painful. But the thing is, is if you've ever broken something, you'll know this. The adrenaline kicks in and you're sitting there kind of going into a panic mode of what just happened. And so I had to kind of breathe and and think, okay, calm down, calm down. I'm not dead. My head doesn't hurt. My neck doesn't hurt. I'm okay. I'm just covered in dirt and my arm is in a lot of pain. Thankfully, I had some friends close by and they came over to check on me and I said, yeah, I broke my arm and I need to probably go to the hospital. So they called 911 and an ambulance came out to get me uh, while they helped me pull my coat off and support my arm. Because if you look at a diagram, in fact, I might even post the x-rays of the break and they actually splintered pretty bad. But if you look at uh, the way an arm is built, the, the two bones in your forearm for me, it's my left forearm, they are side by side. And when that is broken, your arm dips and is so incredibly, incredibly painful. You can't hold your wrist up. You can't move your fingers. Everything is just completely cut off. So the ambulance picks me up, gives me medicine, puts me in a splint, takes me to the hospital. And that's when the pain really started kicking in, even though I had pain meds. The part that I'll never forget is when they put me on uh the table for x-rays and they had to lift my arm up and put this board underneath my arm to take pictures i cannot explain to you the excruciating amount of pain that i felt when they were trying to move my arm and position around it it literally brought me to tears it was so painful like it was involuntary how upset i was but the thing that hurt the most was my muscles inside my arm were twitching or spasming And the reason why they're spasming is because the bone had splintered and cut into the muscle. And so the muscle was freaking out. I hope you guys haven't passed out by now. (laughs) What happened next? So the surgeon came in and looked at my arm and looked at the x-rays and said, I have to do surgery. There's really no other option. And you're already here, so we're just going to schedule it and do it tomorrow. So I laid there in pain for a day and a half until they scheduled me for surgery. And of course they put you under, you wake up five hours later, you don't remember anything, your arm just looks different. So they basically did that. They put in two plates and 12 screws and basically 
put the bones back together so that they will grow back together over time. So I'm not in a cast, which is nice because when your arm itches, it really sucks to try and scratch your skin. Thankfully, um, I'm just kind of in a somewhat mobile arm splint, if that makes sense. All right, so I got to tell you the funny part of this story. So you've heard people always say and do crazy things when they are knocked out for surgery or whatever. So my crazy thing was at the end of the surgery, I woke up briefly. I looked straight at the surgeon intensely and I asked him, you remembered to countersink those screws and Loctite them, right? And though I don't really know what he said or what his reaction was because I don't remember it, he probably just looked at me and just waited for me to pass out again. <laughs> so you're probably wondering two things. Does it hurt? And what, what do I do now? Well, first of all, I can't really feel too much pain with pain meds. It's not, it's not so bad. But the, the part that I really am having trouble with is nerve pain. Like my thumb and my finger are extremely sensitive. And I almost can't even feel them when I touch them. I can't squeeze anything. It's almost like my arm is dead. In fact, a couple of times I woke up in the hospital and my brain was was getting used to the idea of having no arm because they put a nerve block in your arm and it basically cuts off all the feeling. It felt like I had an amputee arm, which is really weird, really, really weird. But as I sit now, I've got a lot of feeling back. I don't have it all back, but I have to do physical therapy, which is kind of where I go from here. So can I fly an airplane? Well, no. I can't even barely fly a drone, which is one of my favorite things to do. My left hand doesn't respond at all, really, and my right hand has a broken finger. So <laughs> it's very difficult to do simple tasks, like pour a cup of coffee without spilling it all over the floor, which has happened already. Now, is that the end of the world? No, it's just going to take time and dedication for me to get back into full mobility. And physical therapy is going to get me there. So I have a goal in mind, and that is to get back into the airplane, which is a reason for me to go and do the physical therapy and to get back. Because there's one thing that I cherish. It's my stick and rudder skills, my ability to do fine movements with the controls to make you know very significant adjustments with the airplane. As some of you may know, I love flying tailwheel. It's my absolute favorite, and I do it often. Right now, there's no way. So, will I fly again? Yes, I will fly again, but I honestly don't know when. But that's okay, because it allows me to reflect on my mistake. <laughs> it allows me to spend time with the family. It allows me to spend time uh, doing this podcast and doing a lot more research. And the truth is, is that you just hit points in life where you just have to take a break. You know, you just have to. There's nothing else that I can do. You absolutely can take the pilot out of aviation, but you you just can't take the love or aviation out of the pilot, if you get what I'm saying. So what are my future plans as a pilot? Well, to be honest with you, I don't know yet. I'm going to spend time building up to that. I'm going to get back to flying drones with my hands. And once I accomplish that, then I'm going to work my way up until I can get my skill set back, get my muscle memory back, and all that stuff. So for now, though, I am going to continue doing what I'm doing. And I wanted to share this story with you guys because this might happen to you. And if it does, you feel free to reach out and I'll kind of help you through the beginning phases of, you know, kind of what to expect. So, but regardless, I'm still a pilot. I still have a drive. I still have a motivation. And I'm not going to stop until I accomplish my goals. And I would encourage you guys to do the same when any kind of obstacle comes your way. It could be money. It could be a physical uh, therapy. It could be sickness, whatever it is. Push through your obstacles. Don't let anybody tell you you cannot do something. And don't let anybody say just because you don't have a certain amount of hours doesn't mean you can't become this kind of pilot. You can. You just have to dedicate time and you have to get your mindset in the right spot. Real quick, before we get to the last subject, I want to share something with you. I think it's important for you to know the mission and the core values that really drive what commercial PIC is all about. So what's really important here is that every pilot's career matters. It really does. It's not just another job. 
and that a pilot's career path is not linear and it really doesn't need to be pretty. However you get it done, however you get your hours, that's what's important. Legally, of course. I wouldn't recommend purchasing flight hours off a Chinese website or anything like that. So <laughs> do it the right way. This next one is big. The time that a pilot spends in general aviation is a crucial part of their journey and of mine and of ours because together it really is about the steps that we took to accomplish our goals. If you just try and buzz through it and get through it as fast as possible, you're going to miss out on a lot. I've got amazing memories and some great times to reflect on from just going out and flying and grinding hours and putting my work in and getting my stripes. So value that. The next one, understand that the relationship between a pilot and the airplane is monumental. It's so much more than just a task. It's a relationship. When you tell the airplane to move a specific way, it responds to your command. And that builds your understanding and that builds your muscle and your your kind of brain to airplane connection which will allow you to understand the physics and the dynamics, the aerodynamics of what's actually happening. Feeling stability, feeling the different wind corrections that need to be made. All that is crucial and important to building that relationship with the airplane that you're flying. And the last mission core value that's important here at Commercial PIC is that the journey to building ours is far more valuable than the destination. All right, here is my pro pilot tip for you guys that are still here listening to this podcast, which I want to thank you very much for still being here. So let's talk about negotiating your job interview. There's a cat and mouse game that happens when you get a job interview, especially an important one. One thing you need to make sure is that don't show your cards, okay? Yes, you want this job, but don't act desperate and don't seem like you have to have this job, even though you might really have to have this job, if you understand what I'm saying. You need to be steady and consistent. The squeaky wheel gets oiled, right? So wear them out a little bit. And what I mean by that is, is don't be annoying. Um, be respectful, but be relentless. Continually follow up every week, every two weeks. Send them an email. Continue to follow up. You got to remember that these people that you're talking to are recruiters, also known as talent acquisition. Their job is to hire people, to bring good candidates in. They're used to this kind of stuff. In fact, if you're kind of laid back and you don't really follow up or maybe you are a people pleaser, you're going to kind of get forgotten and you're going to get kind of buried under the thousand resumes that they already have. You've got to differentiate yourself. You've got to tell them in a respectful way why you are an asset for that company. You need to position yourself well for that talent acquisition person or that recruiter so that when they look at you, you occupy a space in their brain for that job role. It's like they've already tied your face to that job role. It's very difficult to do, but it's actually not that difficult if you just stay consistent, respectful, persistent, and you know your stuff and you're confident. And you can do really well. If you enjoyed and got value from this episode, please take a moment to rate, share, and subscribe and comment on this podcast wherever you are listening. I will read your comments. I might not be able to respond to them, but I will at least let you know that I read them. And I want you guys to remember that together we are a community. And by engaging with this podcast, it will help other pilots discover this content and benefit from it in the same ways that it has benefited you. As always, remember to enjoy the journey and fly that airplane to the finish every single time. Have a great weekend and I look forward to you coming back for the next one.